keeps the awareness active and the comprehension from expanding. That's why a very delicate technique is involved and personal instruction is involved. It's easy, it's natural, but it's delicate. And it's easy to lose it. And I'm afraid it has been lost completely. It's being revitalized again and again throughout history. Of course, Maharshi's own life is dedicated to teaching as many people as possible how to transcend and regain that experience. But unfortunately, we have a society with a certain momentum. We have generations of teachers who've gone to teachers' education or members of teachers' unions that don't always support educational innovation. So it may take a generation, unfortunately, it may take a generation now that simple techniques, universal, non-sectarian, scientifically verified techniques exist to gain enlightenment, it still may take a generation before these life-saving technologies to develop consciousness are reintroduced into education. You said non-sectarian. Does that mean like non-religious? Is that what that you mean by that? The, um. the, the experience of pure consciousness really transcends any one religion or any one philosophy. It's as scientific as it is religious. It is, after all, a state of functioning of the brain, maximally expanded comprehension. It's the direct subjective experience of the scientifically discovered unified field of all the laws of nature. Is that religious? Perhaps, but it's scientific too. So there's no reason that it should be disbarred from education. Otherwise, we're going to get the same old result, 5% development of our mental potential, another generation of war and terrorism and human cruelty, and that'll go on forever until the experience of life's essential unity is bestowed and the brain is properly developed. You know, we talked to we yeah. talked to Jeffrey Satinover and uh, and and Hammeroff, and I think maybe one other physicist said the same thing that because you talk a lot about the observer, and they sort of said that the observe, that whole concept of the observer was a mistake and it's been fixed and it doesn't really mean anything now. What about that? It's true. There's a deeper level of perspective in which the observer does not yet exist, not separate from the observed. The reality of life today is all unity, unified field which unites observer and observed in one indivisible wholeness. Scientifically, we call, it, we call it quantum measurement theory and the ultimate inseparability of the observer from the observed. In the language and science of consciousness, we call it the unity of knower and known in the indivisible structure of pure knowledge, the experience of oneself, the Atman. And what is the self? The self, consciousness, our very subjectivity, is that one thing in our life that has never changed. Intangible that, though it may be, and very difficult to put your finger on. It's that one aspect of our experience that has been with us since childhood. Although our beliefs have changed, our friends have changed, our bodies have changed, typically for the worse, that one thing that gives that continuity to our experience day by day, that's our consciousness. It's our subjectivity. It's the Atman, the self. And that self, which is the same for you as for me, ultimately, is this unified field discovered by science, which is essentially the creator of the universe. That is our authority. That's our dignity. If we only knew ourself and how precious it was, we would rush to experience higher states of consciousness where that experience of our unbounded subjectivity is never lost, even during the depths of sleep. That's okay. I still don't understand. Let me, can I have you rephrase yeah. the question? Yeah, because it's good. It wasn't a very clear what I answer. Understand, rephrase. I'm just telling you. What I don't understand is that some, some people over here, some of the scientists we spoke to, said that the observer is not part of the equation anymore. Right. And yet, people like you are saying that focused intent affects matter. Uh, right. And I want to understand. I want to understand those two disparate views. Okay. Yeah, what he said. There are different truths because our universe is hierarchically structured in layers. The atomic has its own truth. The nuclear world has its own completely different truth. And they're both valid. They're both self-consistent. So there's the truth of diversity, where observer and observed are separately identifiable systems. And there's the deeper truth of unity, in which there is no separation between the observer and the observed. So we can talk about life at all levels. Each level is valid, 
But the deepest level in this scientific age is the level of unity. What has to be very clear about this is a concept most people don't get quite, and it's very important. You can drag me across the floor by my arm. You can drag me across, across the floor by my atoms, or by my nuclei, or by my cells. It all has the same effect. I get dragged across the floor. These are simply different levels of the description of the one reality that is me. So it's legitimate for us to talk about a world of diversity. We see such a world, after all. But it's even more legitimate for us also to talk about the world of unity, the ultimate scientific truth of life. So we get tripped up in semantics if we say that unity alone exists, but there's no such thing as diversity, or that diversity alone exists, there's no such thing as unity. They're both true. They're just different levels of description of the same reality. So, you know, you talk about me and you are one, but we're also separate. Those are just diff levels. different levels. On the physical level, you and I are separate. You're much better looking than I am, more attractive in virtually every way. But at deeper levels, we have a common source. And that is the unified field, the scientifically discovered unified field that is the source of you and the source of me, the source of gravity, the source of electromagnetism, the source of quarks, the source of leptons. Everything in the universe is a common source. So if we look at things at the deepest possible level, we ultimately discover one unified universal reality, of which you're a wave, of which I am a wave. We're all just the different vibrational frequencies, the natural reverberant frequencies of this one universal unified field. Our whole universe is just a symphony. The various, what, harmonics and fundamentals and overtones of one universal field, one universal ocean of consciousness in motion. So let me ask, this. I'm just trying to understand all this stuff. So does that place come from the Planck scale? Or is it yes. Wow, really, yes. I totally understand it for the first time. Oh my God, I'm so excited. <laughs> the, the Planck scale is that small, small distance scale, 10 million, million, million times smaller than the atomic nucleus, where all the forces come together, where all the particles come together as one where you and I come together as one reality, where distance, where causality no longer exist, and there's one unified, indivisible wholeness, which is the unity of consciousness, the unified field of all the laws of nature.